photovoltaic water splitting for sustainable hydrogen production. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Kyle. I'm Anna. This is our senior capstone presentation. Okay, so let's start with the problem that our project was intended to solve. The problem is renewable energy storage. Um, renewable energies are the future of the energy sector. Um, we need to satisfy our energy demands in a way that doesn't put more carbon into the atmosphere, which has been proven uh, to have detrimental effects on uh, the global climate. So in order to do that, we can use renewable energies. One of the key disadvantages of renewable energies is intermi intermittency, um, which means that uh, <coughs> when the energy is available is not necessarily when uh, you would want to use it. So uh, a way around that is to store it, store the energy and then use it um, when you need it. Uh, so one of the ways that energy, the most popular way that energy is stored right now is with electrochemical batteries. Um, and these work fine, but they have certain disadvantages, um, one of which is a limited lifetime. They're environmentally harmful uh, to extract from the earth and also dispose of, and they can be expensive. Um, uh, an alternative to electrochemical battery storage um, is hydrogen storage. So energy can be stored in hydrogen by splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen, capturing the hydrogen, and then recombining it with atmospheric oxygen in a fuel cell. Um, and that reclaims the energy that it initially took to split the water in the first place, essentially treating hydrogen as a chemical battery. So our project's purpose was to utilize this alternative method of storage and create a device called artificial leaf um, that could generate hydrogen using nothing but solar energy. And our aim was to create a device that was um, using only materials that were earth abundant, that were environmentally friendly, and that uh, the materials and processes would be relatively cost efficient. Um, so our artificial leaf is so named because it effectively imitates the first step of photosynthesis, which is splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Um, it generates hydrogen gas on one side of the leaf, and the other side is where the oxygen is generated. Okay, so um, there's some, there's several key stakeholders uh, that are associated with this technology. A stakeholder is essentially anyone that has a vested interest um, or will be in some way affected by uh, a given technology or policy change. Um, so the biggest one is the general public because we all have a vested interest to uh, protect the earth, our home, um, and so we all need to we all need to work together to, to uh, promote renewable energies. Um, another other key stakeholders are renewable energy companies um, and automobile manufacturers, particularly those who uh, manufacture hydrogen cars, um, and also political entities uh, who set the legislative and legal stage, sorry, for, um, for this technology being implemented in society. So our artificial leaf is essentially a photovoltaic cell with additional chemical layers stacked on top of it to act as catalyst to create more voltage in the water splitting process. Um, so how this is generated through the photovoltaic effects uh, first most because um, as the solar energy from the sun hits the photovoltaic cell, it uh, activates electrons and gets them flowing through the device, thus creating an, uh, an electric current. Um, and so this act requires a PN junction from which the electrons can flow through. Um, and so essentially this allows us to capture solar energy and you uh, and use it to turn sunlight into electricity without, gen without using any uh, moving parts. Yeah, so um, we use the photovoltaic effect in our device um, with a process called uh, photoelectrochemical water splitting. It's also known as electrolysis. Um, this is essentially using electricity to cause a chemical reaction. In our case, the chemical reaction is uh, converting H2O into H2 and O2. Um, to do this, you have to overcome the bond energy between hydrogen and oxygen, which happens to be 1.23 volts. So this was the, essentially the, the first goal of our LEAF was to overcome this voltage in order to disassociate uh, the two atoms from each other. 
So to do this, um, you need several integrated layers um, because you have to use the, the solar spectrum efficiently in order to um, get the most voltage out of it. So that's what we did, and we'll go into that in a second. Um, so the differences between our leaf and a traditional uh, silicon cell that you would have on your house or something, um, the main difference is that is what you get out of it. Our leaf is designed to generate hydrogen, um, and a traditional solar cell is designed to produce electricity. Uh, our leaf um, starts with a solar cell composed of gallium arsenide phosphide, is stoked with zinc and tellurium, and we also added additional layers of tin oxide and bismuth vanadate, and we'll tell you why we did that in a second. Um, and whereas a, a typical silicon cell wouldn't have those extra layers, it would just have um, a PN junction in a, uh, a silicon substrate. Um, so the, the physical differences translate to important electrical differences um, between a silicon cell and our cell. Uh, the, main, the most important thing is the voltage. So ours generates, um, is designed to generate uh, above the disassociation voltage that's required to split water, um, whereas a traditional, traditional solar cell only makes about half a volt. And uh, this voltage is directly associated with uh, the energy gap that's inherent in the photovoltaic material that you're using. So why do we choose these two materials for our device? Um, that goes back to looking for materials that are earth abundant, um, cheap to use, and environmentally friendly. So the bismuth vanadate layer matches all this criteria. It is all three of these things. Um, the gallium arsenide phosphide is not necessarily as ideal in this regard because the gallium is not exactly earth abundant and the arsenic can be toxic. Um, but the two of these together work together in a way that was favorable for us, whereas they, comp uh, they utilize complementary parts of the solar spectrum. So like Kyle said, this goes back to their band gaps. Um, bismuth vanadate has a higher band ga gap of about 2.4 electron volts, which allows it to absorb wavelengths um, from around the yellow color downwards. And so this generates a large amount of voltage, but not much, not much current. The gallium arsenide phosphate, on the other hand, generates um, or can absorb wavelengths from around three, 690 because it has a lower band gap of 1.8, which allows it to produce that current that we need. And so the balance of the two is what gives us our desired effect. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give you a quick overview of what we did um, to create an artificial leaf, just so you can, uh, so hopefully it's clear for you guys. Um, step one was creating the PN junction, um, and so that was effectively creating our PV cell. Step two was just applying the fluorine doped tin oxide layer, which is our FTO layer. Step three was depositing the photoanode bismuth vanadate, which is that dark purplish color, um, on the side where the oxygen is going to be generated. Step four was attaching metal contacts, which we did in a way that would allow us to um, test different parts of the solar cell at different times, which was step five, our testing procedures, and we'll go into how and why we did each of these. Yeah. Okay, so the first step was creating a solar cell out of gallium arsenide phosphide. It came uh, pre-doped N-type um, with tellurium. So in order to create a PN junction, um, we deposited uh, zinc oxide on top of the gallium arsenide phosphide um, using spray pyrolysis, which uh, this is the setup uh, a bit disassembled um, that we used, but we'll show a video of that in a bit. Um, and baked it at about 650 degrees Celsius for about an hour. Um, and what that does is uh, encourage some of the zinc atoms to move inside of the gallium arsenide phosphide substrate, um, creating a PN junction, which is uh, the kind of the heart of our leaf. Um, uh, to test the depth of the PN junction, we use cylindrical sectioning and various microscope measurements. And alongside all of this, we also used, or we also uh, synthesized silicon cells um, as control subjects. So the picture on the left here is a uh, gallium arsenide phosphide cell after it was, uh, after we deposited zinc oxide on top of it. Um, and this is kind of a close up of the interface. Uh, this is a, a heating plate and the zinc oxide comes out of this tube in a fog and deposits onto our substrate.
All right, so this is an ultrasonic vibrator that uh, stimulates the, uh, the zinc oxide, which creates a fog, um, which travels through this tube. Sorry, this is actually the bismuth vanadate, but it's essentially the same process. Um, this machine deposits uh, whatever chemical we need um, for the next layer onto the substrate, like that. This is a very um, cheap and easy uh, deposition process. Okay, so um, after we created our solar cell, we the next step was to apply the FCO layer onto um, on top of it. So the purpose for choosing tin oxide, fluorine dope tin oxide, was for multiple reasons. Uh, the main reason was because um, the bismuth vanadate that we eventually put on is porous in nature, so that means that there are gaps in where the water can hit the PV cell, and eventually this can cause corrosion. So we needed some kind of chemical protectant. Um, so tin oxide was good for that for multiple reasons, one of which is because it's electrically conductive, so it wouldn't inhibit any of the electrical properties between the PV cell and the bismuth vanadate. Um, secondly, it's transparent, so any of the light that passes through the bismuth vanadate that should be used by the gallium arsenide to create more voltage passes through the FTO layer um, and without being stopped at all or absorbed at all, and the gallium can use all of it. Mm -hmm. So the deposition process for this was essentially what you just saw, um, just using a different mm -hmm. lipid precursor. For this, we used tin chloride to generate that fog and to deposit it on our PV cell. Um, and it was layered right on top of our zinc oxide, which was left over from when we had doped the PV cell to create that PN junction. Um, after this, we just ran some testing procedures. Uh, one was for thickness using the surface profiler, which is this second image you have here. And it just, it's used to measure very, very small measurements on the order of like nanometers, um, smaller than a human hair. So it's very precise. And we used resistance measurements and calculations just to make sure that the electrical properties weren't um, hindered by the baking processes or anything like that. So after we had uh, completed this layer, we deposited the photo uh, photo sorry, photo anode disadvantage. And the reason for choosing bismuth vanadate was um, because the PV cell on its own can generate about 1 volt. And uh, of course, we need 1.23 volts to split water effectively. So the bismuth vanadate could be expected to generate about 0.2 to 0.3 volts on its own. Um, in addition to that, the bismuth vanadate is where the oxygen would be generated on that side of the leaf so that hydrogen could be split onto the other side of the leaf. The deposition process, again, was the ultrasonic spray pyrolysis with just a different li liquid precursor. Um, and then we baked this, the whole device after doing that, just to really set it in. And um, we baked it at just high temperatures in air, and then again at hydrogen and a mix of hydrogen and nitrogen. And this was to create an optimal crystal structure of the bismuth vanity that could be really used for generating oxygen efficient, efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we ran some testing procedures, the surface profiling for thickness of this layer. And we used a microscope to look at the coverage and the depth of the bismuth vanity. And so this image, Right here, the yellow one on the left, uh, was actually done using an electron microscope, but it really gives you a sense of the depth of the bismuth vanadate. Um, you can see that porous nature and the coverage of it. So once we were satisfied with what we saw, we were able to move on to step four. Yeah, um, so once they were fully synthesized, uh, we attached metal contacts to specific areas of the leaf um, to test, test different parts of it. So we put w one wire on the FTO layer which allowed us to isolate the bismuth vanadate um, and just test its performance. We also put a wire on the back of the PV cell, which allowed us to measure the performance of the entire cell. Um, finally, we encased it in epoxy so that the soldered contacts didn't interrupt the measurement process and also so they didn't break off and also to present, prevent against uh, corrosion. Um, do you want to pass those around? Yeah. We have okay. some samples that you can look at. <laughs> so these, these first two that we'll pass around is um, the, the fluorine dope tin oxide layer, that FTO layer that was right on top of PV cell. And so you can see it's just transparent. Um, there's not much to see, which is the point. Um, and then the second one we'll be passing around is the bismuth vanadate, which is just yellow. As we said, it absorbs any, everything from yellow down. Um, and it's just, these are both just deposited on glass. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we tested our leaves using a solar simulator, which is this device here. It imitates the solar spectrum in frequency and relative amplitude. Um, 
we shined the light on our leaves and basically measured how they performed under different conditions. Um, we did an open circuit voltage test, which essentially just measured the voltage uh, coming out of the leaf. And we also did a, a linear sweep photovoltammetry test. Um, uh, in this test, we used an external power supply that uh, altered the voltage of the circuit um, and measured the current as the voltage was changing. Um, so this gave us an idea of how the cell would perform under different voltage conditions. Um, and the, the current is really important because it's directly proportional to how much hydrogen is actually produced. Um, so if you can measure the current and you can produce uh, an ample current, an ample current, then uh, you can produce ample hydrogen. So that's, that's an important part of it. Um, okay, so like we said, we had attached these metal contacts to different parts of the cell, um, and that was so that we could measure just the bismuth vanadate performance on its own, as well as the total artificial leaf performance. So our first um, test results were from the open circuit test to see the voltage generation. And I'll just go ahead and explain this to you real quick, that we had um, a shutter that would go over the solar simulator lens, and so these dips are where that shutter was shut, and when it opened up again, that's the high points there. Um, and that was just to make sure that nothing weird was going on with our like, with our testing process, just for some uh, consistency. Yeah. So for the bismuth vanadate, we can see that it generates from about 0.2 to 0.3, somewhere in there, volts, um, which isn't enough to split water, which is the dotted line up there at the top, the 1.23 volts we need for electrolysis. But when we added the PV cell with it, you get a voltage. Um, it adds about a volt on its own to give you that for, cross that threshold of 1.23 volts and effectively split water. And so we actually have yeah, um, an example for you. We weren't able to bring in the whole testing process with, uh, with it dipped in water and the solar simulator on it because it just looked too much. But this here is just, it'll just demonstrate the PV cell uh, performance for you. And so when Kyle shines a light on it, if it's done right, it should generate about a volt. Yeah, it, it is generating some voltage just from the ambient light, but you shine a light on it, it will make over a volt, yep. which is the idea. Um, in order to get the full uh, voltage that is required to split water, it has to be inside of the water, and we didn't, couldn't bring that here, but yeah. yeah. Um, um, so the second yeah. aspect of what we needed for this thing to work was to get sufficient current, because like we said, it's directly related to the hydrogen generation that occurs. Um, so Ideally, the sweep test, it generates an external voltage from negative 0.5 volts all the way to one volt. So what we would want is that when it's not giving any voltage to our device, we would want that current to be high enough to generate its own uh, hydrogen. Um, so with the bismuth vanadate, even though it helps with the voltage, it doesn't really generate much current. And a lot of that's due to that high band gap that it has. Yeah. Um, but when you add the PV cell with it, it brings that current up all the way up to one uh, milliamp per centimeter squared, um, which is sufficient enough to generate hydrogen, which is what we really wanted. Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the first problems that we ran into throughout the year um, was a failure of the electrical properties of the PV cell after baking the tin oxide layer um, on top of it. So we considered replacing the tin oxide, um, we considered not using the tin oxide at all, and um, we finally landed on um, leaving the zinc oxide on. And if you remember, the zinc oxide was the doping material that we used to make a PN junction. Um, and the original idea was to bake the zinc into the substrate and then remove the excess zinc. But uh, instead of that, we just leave the zinc on and put the FTO on top of that. And that actually preserved the electrical properties. Um, so that was exciting. Uh, and uh, the second uh, biggest thing we were trying to combat was the current um, generated by the bismuth vanadate. Uh, and the, so the current is directly proportional to the amount of uh, actual bismuth vanadate that's put on top of the cell. So we increased the deposition time and we also added an additional layer underneath the bismuth vanadate um, of tungsten oxide. Um, and that was so to spots where the bismuth vanadate didn't cover the entire cell, it would at least generate some oxygen. It's not as good as bismuth vanadate, but uh, it does help.
Right, so um, basically our cell worked, and if we scaled it up, um, it would generate some hydrogen. If it was as big as um, one meter by one meter, it would make uh, approaching five liters of hydrogen per hour, um, and that's at uh, standard temperature and pressure. Um, if it was scaled up to 100 by 100 meters, which is very big, uh, <laughs> it could generate uh, 92 liters of hydrogen per hour uh, at 500 bar. So that's highly compressed. And um, we put it in, in those terms because hydrogen is typically stored highly compressed and refrigerated. Um, so that's, that's kind of the order of magnitude that hydrogen's uh, dealt with. And um, one of the ways that hydrogen is stored is in uh, a hydrogen car. And so this amount of hydrogen would be enough to fill a hydrogen car in 1.3 hours, so it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so the the aim for implementation is finding um, an inexpensive and environmentally friendly hydrogen production process. Um, so our project only used low cost manufacturing techniques, um, and if this were to be scaled up, the economies of scale would come into place and, uh, and make it even cheaper. Um, along with a concept called roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing, um, and yeah, that's it for that. Okay, so for as far as uh, we would like to see this project researched further, um, ideally, like if it were to be scaled up, we would have to have some research into how you could scale that up, and so one of the methods is that roll-to-roll -roll production. Um, so similar to how a lot of PV cells are made today, it's almost like an assembly line process, but it's just one large sheet that has all these things going happening to it, everything in order, so that way when it comes out of that process, it's a full PV cell. And so we would like to see this happen with our spray pyrolysis of baking to see um, after it goes through that one line of just multiple processes, you have a complete leak at the end, and you could really produce these very cheaply this way. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is we'd like to see a replacement for gallium arsine phosphide so that the whole leaf can really be um, environmentally friendly and inexpensive. Um, and then lastly, increasing the current production is arguably one of the most important things that can happen for future research because that is directly related to increasing the efficiency of the leaf and getting more hydrogen out of this leaf. Um, and so actually, the next year's capstone group has uh, plans to do this, or research this at least, um, and they are going to focus on improving the photo uh, photo uh, photocatalyst current production uh, by uh, manipulating the bismuth band date. and so they're looking into manipulating the different textures of all these layers and seeing if that can have some effect on um, the production of, gen of hydrogen. Yeah. So in conclusion, uh, we created JMU's first artificial leaf, successful artificial leaf. Um, <laughs> um, and so this is all done using low-cost processes right here at JMU, just uh, mainly that ultrasonic spray pyrolysis that you show that we showed you, and a lot of that material was like created in the machining lab. Um, and overall, we believe that we increased the scientific community's knowledge of implementing thin filaments, thin films to create an artificial leaf and artificial leaf, and hopefully those will make everything easier in future research for everyone. Yeah, um, we'd like to say thank you to Dr. David Lawrence. He's in the back there. He's yes. really the mastermind behind all of this. <laughs> We couldn't have done it without him. He definitely could have done it without us, but we're happy to be along. <laughs> no, we're, really, we, I, I love doing this. It, I learned a lot and had a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to thank the, the college for providing the labs and all the materials and uh, that we used to do all this research. Our lab partner, Megan, who might have left by now. Uh, <laughs> oh, there she is. Is she yeah, here? Right. Oh, sh I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the ISAT faculty who have taught us all about physics and chemistry and energy and all this exciting um, research. Uh, previous researchers who provided the wealth of knowledge that we relied on to know or have a better idea of what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, and previous JMU students who have done the same project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to questions. Yeah, questions.
Yes. Do you look at real leaves differently now? <laughs> so hard yeah. To make one? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, got a question. Yeah. If this hopefully gets brought up uh, full scale, um, mm -hmm. is this, I guess, technology only going to be used in places with available water, not, you know, Midwest or anything? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the advantages, um, or one of the, the kind of thoughts about implement implementing this technology um, is that it could be used in seawater, ideally. Um, especially since seawater has a lot of salt, which is an electrolyte that helps the, which you would put in this solution anyway. Um, so ideally it would, it would be used in seawater. Um, you could use it uh, with fresh water, but I mean, then you're depleting that resource, so it's just a, a cost benefit kind of analysis thing. Um, yeah, you do reclaim the water when you uh, use the hydrogen, but as far as I know, it's it's not exactly common to capture that water back. Like a lot of hydrogen cars just shoot it out of the tailpipe or whatever. So mm -hmm. it but depends. But it could be turned into some sort of, with more research, some sort of desalinization process as well if it's used like that. Yeah. Um, I like how you guys already kind of looked into a, a little, the, the bigger picture of where it might go. Um, so I'm going to build off that for a minute. So do you think it might be, um, particularly to a hydrogen car, do you think it would be out of the realm of possibility to possibly see an upscaled up version of a cell directly mounted on a car to directly produce hydrogen <laughs> for the vehicle to continue driving? <clears throat> kind of like a solar, but uh, yeah. with it, with, so is a concern just a water, so that, water supply then? That would be interesting. I think the main concern would be the efficiency of the cell. Okay. I don't think the the roof of a car would be, I mean, it would be like powering, putting a, a solar panel on top of your car. It's, mm -hmm. it's not really possible. It just, okay. just doesn't make enough electricity. Okay. Um, but it, our situation is a bit different because when the car is parked, it would still be generating hydrogen mm -hmm. be, because it's a, um, it's a storage technology ultimately. Sure. So possibly, yeah, okay. I, I don't know. That's awesome. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Um, so when the gas, if there's gas that was created, you know, uh -huh. does it reduce the efficiency of the leaf? So it like creates gas around it. Uh, yeah. Talking about the water, how it actually increased the voltage, but uh -huh. then you're saying that the air was a problem. So if the air like accumulated around it, would it? It reduce does. The efficiency. Yeah. How, how do you think with like? Is there a way you want to pressure also, um, how are you going like, to extract the hydrogen and like, pressure it? Because you're talking about really high pressure and storage. Right. So like wondering how you want to well, so, yeah, so the first thing you said is true. Um, we actually were just talking about that today. Um, uh, yeah, when, when a bubble is on the actual leaf, the water is not in contact, and so it, it is not making hydrogen there. Um, so this is kind of way in the future research, but yeah, how to extract the actual hydrogen from the leaf to increase its efficiency as it's producing hydrogen. Um, I don't have a solution to that, but yeah, it's certainly something that would need to be looked into. Um, and sorry, what was the second thing you mentioned? You're talking about like um, capturing hydrogen. Right. How, um, usually it sounds like you kind of want that in your backyard or something in order to store energy. You know, that's a, I, I'm guessing that's a lot of pressure. It is. Of storage, so how that's going to take either energy or just It does, energy. and that's really the major drawback uh, to hydrogen storage is that it, uh, I've heard estimates around a third of the energy that you get from the hydrogen um, actually goes into pressurizing and cooling it. So it, in that sense, it's it has a major inefficiency flaw. Um, but it, it, it has other advantages, so, you know, it's, whatever storage technique um, works the best for you is what you should use. Um, and we just wanted to advance this technique or you know, figure out what else we could do with it. Yeah. Any other questions? Have you, yeah. could you go, uh, I don't know if you went in this direction at all. I mean, yeah. You cited cost at one point in the sort of a level of the technology that you use here. Uh, did you, did your analysis get into it all with cost, let's say per unit of energy produced, and did you do, a, do any comparison with other forms of, shall we say, clean energy? Yeah, n no. Okay. 
we didn't really do that at all. Um, I, I think the main thing is that our our research or what we were producing was on such a small scale that for any considerable production, we would be taking pretty wild guesses as to how much it would actually cost to, to do this. I mean, I think we can compare different production methods to, and say one's cheaper than the other in general, but I, I don't know any specifics. And that wasn't really, yeah, the focus of our research. Yeah. And, and as, as they mentioned, uh, a key element of this particular leaf is a gallium arsenide phosphide, uh, which comes in a wafer form. It's a crystalline material. So the ultimate aim is to eliminate that, replacing it with more thin coatings made much the same way uh, they made uh, uh, zinc oxide, tin oxide, bismuthanidate, but sprayed on coatings. So mm -hmm. as uh, I believe it was Anna who mentioned, like a roll-to-roll -roll coating process where you right. could imagine foil coming off a huge spool, going through, getting all this stuff sprayed on it, out the other end comes the complete uh, finished leaf-like material. And that, in principle, if that can be fully developed, it could be very cheap. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>